<laughs> great uncle, great uncle. That's what it was. Hello, welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Here at Cabinets HR, we recently launched our equity crowdfunding campaign out on Refunder. If you have more information, go to refunder.com slash Cabinets HR. Our guest today is Jay Lyman. Jay, you ready to be great today? I am ready. So Jay, a non-library topic, what's some things you do for fun, like hobbies and stuff you do when you're like not at work? Yeah, I, I enjoy uh, camping, uh, a lot of things outdoors, kayaking, uh, stand-up paddleboarding, uh, fly fishing, and uh, of course, I like to read as well, too. <laughs> that would be kind of weird, a library of those I like to read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how long have you been kayaking? Kayaking, how do you say a word? Uh, kayaking? Like, we, I've been kayaking, boy, I think we, uh, we got our, our kayak in about 2013, 2012. Uh, yeah. So how does it work? Like you're in you you're in there and it flips over. What kind of safety? Method? Like you just like gotta you gotta flip it back over some kind of way. They train you to do that, or like I can imagine like being a, like a first time person doing that. You flip over the first time. You're just like <laughs> ah. It's pretty scary you know, the first time that flips over. Um, ours is a, a lake kayak, and so it's pretty stable, and uh, so it's pretty hard to flip it over. Is it pretty common for <laughs> to flip over? Uh, I think with the ones that are like more narrow and the ones that go in. Uh, the ones that, that you use to go down white, white rider rafting, you, you'd flip over pretty often. Um, but ours is pretty, it's pretty stable and, and it's wider than than those. So what's the farthest out of the deepest in the water you've been? Uh, I, we've taken it out in uh, the middle of Lake Washington, which is pretty deep. Uh, we've also taken it into, uh, we like to go up to Baker Lake, um, which is a, a fun lake. Not a super deep lake, but, um, but we'll, we'll go out and, and kayak around. In fact, I'm going there this weekend. Some guess it's pretty not advisable to take it like, you know, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean to do it right. Yeah, you, I, I probably wouldn't take ours out there. <laughs> I don't think it would fare well with the like big waves, <laughs> but Puget Sound might be all right. I think it'd be fine. And how long have you been paddle boating? Uh, paddle boarding, we started uh, around 2017. Uh, I like to go up to Orcas Island and uh, they have these gorgeous lakes up there. And so we rented some paddle boards. Loved it, and now we have our own uh, paddleboard that we take up there every year. And I've never done. I've never done. I always heard like no, you, you're like really like uh, or like increases your calf muscles. Yeah, like, you can really feel it. Yeah. <laughs> and your core too. You can mm -hmm. feel you can feel that motion. It's surprising because you feel like you're out there on the water, just sort of you know paddling leisurely. But when you get back in, you can feel, feel that uh, that core. And you like go out for thirty minutes a time, hour at a time, just go out and paddle how much you want to paddle. Depends on the day. the day, mostly like an hour, 30 minutes, come back and we, we take it pretty leisurely. Okay. Um, anytime you've been on the middle of the lake and you get that kind of severe muscle cramp. Uh, I haven't, but, no? okay. but if that happens, uh, you can sit down. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You ever have any instances where like you say like some, you know, like, um, whatever, not, not whales, of course, like, you know, like animals come to you and like kind of poke around, like, what is this thing doing here? We see fish and things uh, out 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 there. Most of the time, we're doing the stand up paddle boarding. We're on a uh, lake, so there's not any like large okay. large animals in there. Uh, but uh, but 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 we we definitely see fish and things. You like taking any photographs when you're doing this? Sometimes, yeah, I can, yeah. You get some pretty nice photographs. Yeah, yeah. I do. I do uh, like to. Uh, that's another hobby that I like is photography. So any particular type of photography, like like nature or like nighttime or nature uh things of uh, our camping trips I, I like to just kind of like photo journal of uh trips and things that uh that we like to do and things like that okay. so i gotta ask when you go camping do you real camp like at the tent and on the ground or are you like one of those glam clappers they take this big ass rv and go in the middle of the woods <laughs> <laughs> uh, mostly tent okay. <laughs> mostly like uh we sleep in a tent yeah. although as i got older uh Instead of sleeping in a the on the like the the foam uh, kind of mattress, I I do have a little cot uh, that I set up, and uh, it makes that uh, that nighttime experience uh, much more uh, comfortable. <laughs> so, what's the most amount of days you've been camping? What's that? What's the most amount of days you've gone camping in a row? Oh, I'll go for uh, uh, I'll go for a week. Okay, um, and uh, this it's about um, about the the longest you know length. But any favorite camping spots? 
in the area? Orcas Island is gorgeous. Island? Okay. Uh, uh, you have to be, at, uh, we stay at, stay at the state park. And so you have to uh, reserve your campsites uh, ahead of time, nine months ahead of time. And they're pretty oh, whoa, competitive. Nine months? Oh, whoa. So you got to plan your camping That's trip insane. way out. <laughs> uh, so when you, so when you first started camping, like how long did it take you to like, you know, get used to all the nature, right? I imagine you were camping the first day, like hear all the noise at nighttime. You're like, I'm not saying scared, but like, okay, what's this noise? What's that noise? How long does it get used to like camping pool? Well, the nature noises. Yeah, well, for me, actually, I grew up, uh, I grew up camping. So like my some of my earliest memories are uh, out in the Pacific Northwest here and some some of the gorgeous trails with my father. Um, so for for me, I uh, kind of, I kind of grew grew up with it, and and it never really was, you know, super frightening. I mean, there there there, there have been moments where I was like, "Huh, what's that noise?" <laughs> uh, but uh, but I'm not. I'm pretty you know comfortable and used to to being out in 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 that kind of environment. Ever have any close encounters like a bear came by sniffing around or mountain lion like looking for food or just in, in pretty much safe all the time? Yeah, not never. No, I, no exciting stories to tell. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like that 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 kind of was scary or dangerous. Okay. Uh I, I I have seen uh I have seen bears and and things like that, but they were more afraid of me than uh than I was of it. <laughs> and who do you camp with? Like your family comes with you, friends, or do you go solo sometimes? Uh, mostly either uh, family or friends. Um, I've, I have uh, maybe a few. Uh, I've, very rare, have, rarely have I uh, done like kind of solo camping or even overnight uh, kinds of things. But uh, most of the time, I enjoy uh, doing that kind of activity with with my family, my wife, my kids, uh, or with friends um, that enjoy uh, going out and and camping and things too. And what's the coldest you've been out there in? Like the like freezing temperature, snow all over the ground. Like, what's some of the coldest you've been? Yeah, I'll snow. Be, <laughs> I remember one night we we hiked up into the uh, Cascade Mountains uh, up to this lake, and uh, and and it, there was a lot of snow, and it, that was a cold night. <laughs> the next morning, we like packed up quick, and got out. <laughs> and like, what do you usually do for food? Like, you know, you're fishing in the lake or something. You bring your food with you. You like jerky, or how do you, how does the food thing work? Yeah, bring bring food that you can either make or uh, or that's like you know, just jerky or things that are like, you know, freeze dried or things that are ready to go. Uh, I will uh, so pack a lot of snacks and and pack things that you can make pretty easily just with uh, camping either on the fire or on a uh, camp stove. I usually bring a camp stove. Um, yeah, I do fish while I'm out there, but I, I catch and release. I, I like to leave <laughs> the you? fish okay. there. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then, um, so you're out there camping. Suppose you do go on a 30 day camping trip, right? Like, what do you actually do, right? You just sit around the campfire telling stories. Like, I mean, I couldn't say like, I mean, like 24 hours a day, you sleep eight hours a day. I mean, there's just so much you can do, right? Is it, or is just a fan of like being alone by yourself, your family, like this, you know, like conversating with them versus not having all the like, tech stuff around. Yeah, that's it, it, all of that. <laughs> so like, you know, hang out, hang out around the campfire, tell stories, uh, enjoy good food together um, that we bring along and, uh, uh, sometimes, sometimes we bring games like board games and things that we'll play. Uh, but, but more often, you know, we'll, it's more like also just we'll go out on a little hike on a, on a trail, um, go out on the kayak or go on the stand up paddle board. Uh, if, if there's water nearby, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do, uh, uh, sometimes we'll, uh, just hang out around the fire and just relax. And, and, and of course reading too, like they'll bring a book, <laughs> bring a good book. But not a Kindle, no, not an, not a Kindle. An actual book, an actual book. Right. <laughs> Usually, I bring an actual book, but uh, my wife brings a Kindle because okay. <laughs> you know why? Because she can read at night mm -hmm. very easily, yeah. laying there in the in the in in the bed. So yeah, yeah. So you've been camping for like a little like a, a few years, right? Yeah. So let's suppose someone's listening to this and they went, "Man, I want to start camping or hiking or being in nature." What advice you give them? Like what equipment to buy? Like you know how to get started? Like a novice, so to speak. Yeah, if you're a novice, you know I. I think one thing that I would I would encourage people to do is that they uh, you know the camping gear can be expensive you know so I, you know, before you go out and you know you know spend your paycheck at REI uh, you can you can rent gear um, that you need um, from some of some of the local like uh, equipment stores and uh, and there are equipment outfitters that'll uh, help you out and uh, you know do that first because you don't want to like invest in it and then like. Wow, I don't like this, and <laughs> go and and uh, you know, and, and then have to sell all the stuff too. But uh, and then I would uh, select a, a 
a place that's uh, it's not too far away, you know, like uh, that you can, uh, so that if you do have that experience of it being too cold or whatever, you know, you, you come home the next day. <laughs> so let's suppose someone's going out hiking. I mean, not hiking, but camp by, by themselves. First time doing it by themselves. What advice do you them if you had with them, like as far as being safe, like you need to bring bear spray or like something else with them? Yeah, I wouldn't bring bear spray in the in in this in the on the western side of the Cascades. Um, there's some places, you know, in Alaska where you definitely want to do that. I haven't done a lot of camping up there in that area. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, we are so fortunate to live in such a beautiful area that also, like, there's not a lot of, you know, uh, predators <laughs> in terms of like other, you know, the, the I've seen in my life, uh, maybe two uh, black bear when I was up camping. And that was when I was in a vehicle and they were running away from me. <laughs> uh, uh, there's not, uh, you know, poisonous snakes like you have, east, you know, other places. Uh, so you don't need to worry about all those things. I would say that, uh, you know, the biggest thing you got to worry about are like, you know, going at a time of the year and, and being, being cognizant of you know, are there going to be bugs? <laughs> are there going to be like, are the mosquitoes heavy and those kind of things? Because that can, that can, uh, it's not da super dangerous, but it, but it can, you know, impact your experience. Yeah. So back to the library real fast. Yeah. So libraries have been around since the beginning of time, right? Pretty much right. So actually, I just saw this something, right? Off, not off topic, on topic. So the library of Alexandria is like one of the best libraries ever, right? Yeah. And, you know, like I said, Destroy, I make this up, maybe it got destroyed by a fire, right? All this knowledge was lost. I, I like how much knowledge was lost with that? Was it everything? Because I heard people said all, all tech at that time, like all information was lost, right? How true is that or not true? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a, uh, an expert on that in that area, but I, uh, what I do know is that, that a lot of things, a lot of things were lost, um, but there were things that survived as well too from, from that, uh, from that time frame. Uh, as I understand it, I'm not, but again, I'm not a, like uh, a, a historian in that, that area. So I'm not sure. Okay. Is there any like um, libraries that you want to go visit just for like historical purposes? Yeah. Yeah. Some of the li libraries in, uh, in England, uh, some of the uh, libraries uh, in, in Europe are like just such gorgeous places. I had, I was fortunate to be able to go um, last year and visit a, a library in Portugal. Uh, that was just, you know, so beautiful. Um, they didn't allow you to take pictures in there. Uh, and, and being a photographer, I was kind of like, oh no. <laughs> but but I, I I got it. I respected it. Uh, but uh, you know, really really gorgeous uh, library uh, in a in a town called Coimbra, uh, uh, which was the capital city of uh, Portugal uh, before it moved to Lisbon. Is there something like a national society or international society of library or librarians? Yeah, the, uh, there's a American Library Association is a, a big uh, library association, but there are lots. We have our local uh, Washington Library Association, which is very uh, supportive of uh, libraries in Washington State. Um, and there are other organizations um, that uh, that exist around uh, to support various kinds of work. So I'm uh, sometimes involved in the work of a, a group called Entralib, uh, Entrepreneurship in Libraries. Uh, and they do a, a, a at least once a year uh, a, a conference to support librarians who are doing the similar kind of work that I do. So when people are kids, you know, whether you're male or female, or, I mean, boy or girl, you want to be like a superhero, maybe a singer, athlete, you know, scientist. Most people don't want to be a librarian when they grow up, right? <laughs> yeah. So can you explain like how do you became like what 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 age or what made you decide like I want to be a librarian as a career? Yeah. Yeah, so I um I always loved books. I was always a, an avid reader, so uh, that it it kind of came naturally to me in that respect. Um, but but that decision to become a librarian and to go to library school uh, to to become a librarian um, for me didn't happen until I was in college at Evergreen State College uh, down here in Olympia. Uh, I was working on an individual study contract because um, any faculty member at uh, Evergreen can. Uh, help a student sign off on a uh, individual co study contract that the student designs. Uh, and I, I did this research project that I was working on and I worked and, and I, I had a, a librarian that I was working with um, who uh, was mentoring me and was my, my professor for that, that course that I, that I built um, for myself. She, uh, she was supporting all my research and things. And there was this moment in the quarter where I, 
realized I was less interested in the topic I was researching than I was in the work she was doing. That was the turning point for me because I was I, was, I saw how powerful her uh, skill set was and how she could take something that I had uh, I was interested in and 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 really embrace that and support me. And I, I, I had that moment of like, wow, I want to do what she's doing. <laughs> so stereotypically, librarians are like, you know, middle age, older white ladies, right? <laughs> Obviously, you're a guy, right? How has that affected you, like, in your career path, like being like, I'm guessing one of the few guys in the library system? Yeah. Or, or has that changed? Is it more even now? I think, you know, we we work to have a very diverse uh, group of of people that work at the library. Um, and... Uh, and uh, so I work alongside uh, all kinds of um, people from different backgrounds and ethnicities and uh, and and uh, genders and 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 things. And I uh, and and I love that. That's a, a, a wonderful part of my work is that I get to work with uh, a, you know a, a range of people who have different backgrounds and speak different languages. And you know together as a you know we together we are stronger um, in our support of community. Uh, because of that diversity and because of that uh, range of skill sets and backgrounds and things. And do most librarians like have a social degree, a bachelor's in library science, master's degree? Like, what's their average? For that? Yeah, good question. To become a uh, an act, to become a librarian, um, you have to have a master's at least in in uh, in our area in in Seattle and King County. Uh, you have to have a master's in library science or an equivalent degree. Um, so it's this, you know, that, but there are other uh, uh, team members um, who don't have uh, master's degrees who do work um, in, of various kinds of the library. And, you know, people often realize that they're, you know, for Seattle Public Library, there are 750 employees uh, and it takes, you know, the group of us like the, it, to, to do all that work, you know, and we all, you know, do different things, but but there's librarians and there's library associates uh, and there are uh, other uh, uh, people who do tech, uh, people who support us with events and things. So there's a range of kinds of, of occupations within the library as well. So Jay, what does one learn when they get a library science degree? Because like library <laughs> sounds kind of boring science, you know, I'm never, you know, like, you know, like what do you learn just how to research or like, I'm sure there's a lot more to it, right? Yeah, re um, research is is part of it. Um, one of the interesting things, uh, one, one of my favorite classes uh, when I was at library school at the, at the University of Washington, uh, was around how to uh, how to uh, conduct what what we call the reference interview. So, in a reference interview, you know, when people people come into the library and then they ask us questions, and librarians are are really good at taking uh, a question and, and answering it. But one of the things that we study and one of the things that we, you know, learn and, and talk about is uh, this coming to an understanding of what people what people's real, real question is. They come to, to come, come up to a reference desk and they ask the librarian a question. But often what we realize is that's not the question they really wanted to ask. It's the third question that they that they ask us um, that's really starting to get at the core of it. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, you know, and, and I think I think it's varied and it can be like each experience can be you know, quite different. Um, but but if you think about it, you know, maybe the person might be um, asking the question that they think we expect them to ask or that uh, maybe that's the question that's like top of mind. But the real kind of like gut thing that they're trying to understand is uh, you know, is something that's much more nuanced, and uh, maybe they don't even understand how to frame the question uh, that they want to answer. And so that through this series of, uh, of back and forth, we call it the reference interview, we can start to get at that real core question, and then take that and translate that into, well, here is a book or a database or a, a resource that can help answer that question. Uh, and and so so we're so we're kind of starting to understand what the real uh, information need is, then translate that to resources that exist that can answer it. Uh, so that that's one of the things that uh, that I I learned at in library school. But it's also one of those things that you know even after learning it, you have to do it and do it over and over to get good at it. <laughs> so obviously that's a learned skill. A lot of muscle memory from your from your um, experience with other librarians or people in general. How long does it usually take them to like, you know, really lock down that skill? 
and be really good at it. I think everybody's everybody's different, you know. So some people maybe come to it more more quickly. Um, others um, take some longer. Uh, and uh, so yeah. So I mean, for me, probably it was maybe a couple of years of working on the desk before I really got comfort comfortable um, doing doing all of that. Um, and and even today, I'll, I'll be honest. Like sometimes people uh, will come up with a question, and I'll be like. Whoa! <laughs> how are we gonna get, how are we gonna answer that? You know, like hold on, we got to figure out some way to to uh, kind of navigate this. Uh, and I think about librarians being almost like concierge, you know, in in that respect of like we're helping guide people through that journey. Um, and I, I will say that when I get one of those like really hard questions, I love it because uh, those are the things that are going to help challenge me and help me grow and help me uh, be more prepared for that next person that comes and ask another hard question. <laughs> so Jay, when someone comes to the library and they don't speak English, like speak Vietnamese or some other different kind of language, how does that work? Like, I'm pretty sure you don't have like a translator to speak all languages in there, right? How do y'all work through that? You like, I'm like this, how does that work? Yeah, yeah, we 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 take each situation as it comes uh, and try to figure out a way uh, around um, any kind of barriers like that. Uh, so, uh, in some cases, um, there might be a team member that speaks that other language. Um, I, I have a colleague who speaks Spanish and offers um, business information appointments in that in that language. Uh, we also have other team members that speak you know various various languages um, that sometimes can. Um, help us uh, either uh, sort of navigate, you know, what is the question? How can we, uh, how can we help? Um, and it, we, we sometimes have used um, a language, you know, in, uh, interpretation line. Um, uh, but, be, you know, things sometimes get lost in that, you know, that you have this, you know, this third party that's in there, you know, trying to in on the fly kind of interpret <laughs> what's going on and, and, uh, and so, you know, if we if we can have a, a a team member that that speaks that language, member of that community, that's even uh, much 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 better if we can. A library, do you attract like how to make say this question correct? Like, do you attract like what percentage of Hispanics come in? What percentage of, like different languages come in? Like, you know, like for the month of June, twenty percent of the British like spoke Spanish, maybe five percent spoke spoke like Somali or something like that. Um, it it really depends. Um, some some of the services that we run with Library to Business. Um, we do uh, have a survey that we ask people um, when they uh, do, you know, when they sign up, um, and that does ask. Uh, it doesn't ask language uh, kinds of questions, but it, um, but it asks, uh, you know, what, how people identify um, in in different ways, age, you know, some of those demographic mm -hmm. characteristics. Um, but uh, but, so, but some of that stuff, you know, we don't collect um, uh, because we we don't want it to be a barrier either, um, and. Uh, uh, so I don't have like you. I don't have your uh, even even for those those surveys that we do ask when people sign up for an appointment. Um, those are optional. So okay. some people fill them out, some people don't, and so we have to. And we and and we want that to be optional because we don't want we don't want people to. So libraries are they like part of the local city government, state government, their nonprofits? So like how do they actually run? Yeah, Seattle Public Library is part of. We are a city entity. We're a department of the city of Seattle. Um, but then, of course, uh, nearby, we have the King County Library System, which has its own uh, uh, structure, uh, Pierce County uh, Library System, Tacoma, you know, each, it, so there's different library systems around, and each of them um, is kind of structured with funding-wise differently, um, but most of them are, well, yeah, most of the, the libraries, we're, we're talking about public libraries, um, are some sort of government entity, you know, maybe they're, uh, uh, you know, a, a unique entity unto itself or part of a city government. And do you, but despite, despite that being like a public entity, you see how people like private cities that donate to the library, like funds and stuff like that. And if that's too true, like y'all do like fundraisers to bring this private money in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so for Seattle public library, as an example, the library itself um, being a government entity doesn't do the fund doesn't, doesn't do fundraising. Um, but there is a, uh, and uh, there are actually two entities. Uh, one is the uh, Friends of the Library, and then there is the uh, Seattle Public Library Foundation, um, both of which do some uh, fundraising type uh, things uh, for the library. Uh, fund, the Library Foundation, uh, Seattle Public Library Foundation, 
uh, does amazing work uh, working with donors, um, individuals, organizations to um, uh, who are donating money that then uh, goes to um, help the library in its mission doing work that it wouldn't otherwise be able to do with um, those the, the city budget. Uh, Friends of the Library similarly does you know raise money. Uh, they they all they uh, run like our our Friends of the Library gift shop at the Central Library, which has a lovely selection of uh, of books and uh, uh, things that you you know that the branded materials, but also like interesting locally made uh, products and things. Uh, and they also run the Friends of the Library book sale, which is a, a fundraiser that happens. Um, I think it's on an ongoing basis now. It used to be like kind of twice a year, but I think they do more often now. So the main library is on really Fourth and Seneca, correct? Yeah, that's our central library. And then you have like all these annexes across all these neighborhoods, right? Yeah, 27 locations across the city of Seattle. And so like, is that pretty much run the same way? Like, is it like a public library, all these annexes, like equal partners, or is this like one big Seattle public library system? Uh, we're all part of the same that same system, and we all report up to the city librarian, um, uh, Tom Fay. Uh, and uh, we work closely with each other. Uh, and, and, and my program is a good example of a program that works um, citywide. So I have team members that are intentionally uh, not at the Central Library, but in Southeast Seattle or uh, Northeast or uh, uh, various uh, parts of the city um, so that they are kind of on the ground, making connections, uh, talking to people who are starting and growing businesses in our uh, in our neighborhoods around the city, so I got to make sure access is right. So if you're a librarian in the main library and library at the annex, are you considered like equal, or is that considered like more prestigious, or you get a promotional raise if you go to the main library, or does it matter where you're at? You're a librarian. <laughs> We're all colleagues, <laughs> so uh, and and we do we do different uh, different types of work, uh, but but we. Uh, but we're we're equals in that regard. Uh, that okay. that we work we work alongside each other uh, rather than like them reporting up to to us. All right. So back to college, two part question. Like, do most colleges have like li library science? And second part is like, is it like considered a top tier library school where like you know if you want to go the best of best library education, you want to go to this college? Well, they're basically all the same. Uh, uh, not every school has a, a library school, or not every college has a library school um, in the area. Um, you know, University of Washington has the I school um, is our uh, the, the the local uh, local uh, library school, um, but there are a lot of other uh, uh, library schools around around the country and the world. Um, I mean, I mean, I'm a I'm a UW alumni, so I'll <laughs> plug plug the I school, and I think that uh, the work they do is amazing. Uh, but there's uh, there's other uh, libraries, uh, you know, library schools around around the country that that also have uh, good reputations and 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 things. Uh, so uh, so I won't I won't say one is better than the other, <laughs> uh, but. But but of course, you know, my alumni is yeah, yeah, UW. Obviously. So <laughs> so what's a career path for librarians? Like you no know, library internship, a social librarian, like librarian in general, superior li like not superior, but like a senior librarian. Mm -hmm. Is like a career path to this? Yeah, yeah. So there's um there you said it right. There's there are uh, uh, supervising librarians. There's uh, there there are. Um, library associates, which um, could could be, so there's a library associate one, library associate two, library associate four, you know, th that that um, could, th th that do different work. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and I will say also that some, some librarians, uh, you know, what we've been talking about so far is, you know, public libraries, but then there's this kind of differentiation between public libraries and academic libraries, libraries that support uh, people in 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 a uh, uh, educational institution of of some sort, like UW or something. Um, and then there are what they call special libraries, uh, which are uh, business libraries. So libraries that exist, you know, in a uh, an accounting firm or in uh, the like. Uh, like Microsoft has has librarians that that are on staff there, uh, so that, so you have these like special libraries, which kind of is a different kind of branch, uh, and and then even even then you know you might have like librarians who went and got the library degree and end up uh, being uh, doing work that's more like um, 
information science, IT, data science, those kinds of things. So the librarian, I have to imagine like that stuff changes all the time. You have to go to work, right? So how do you personally like, keep up to date with everything you need to? Yeah. Uh, one of my first days at the library, a uh, colleague uh, that, I, that I was working with uh, said it. He, you know, I, I walked in and I was that like new new librarian and like was was talking to a, a, a group of others and you know and i uh i said you know like teach me show me show me the show me how this works and he said you just got to take the questions <laughs> and you'll learn the, the patrons are going to teach you everything you need to know from the questions and, and so that kind of like you're like oh, okay so and he was right you know at each of those questions that come through each of those little reference interviews um teaches me things that I learned that helped me be more, uh, you know, uh, ready to, to, to help that next person that comes, comes to, to need help. Are there any library jobs that I could say like more for teachers, like example, like you, you've been at Seattle Public Library for, like, for a while, I'm assuming you're happy, but suppose I'm guessing the library of Congress called you and say, hey, we have a job for you. <laughs> like, are those like, would that be more prestigious? Like, there's jobs like that out there that people want to do? Is this a librarian is a librarian, you're just doing your job, so to speak? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that there are, but, but also you have to kind of consider you know for at least for me like if that opportunity came up i would probably pass because i like being you know i i like where i live and that, that whole experience of living in you know in western washington uh, and it's home for me so uh but the you know the, I, I think there are like you know you know there, there are libraries that you know that uh are that that have some kind of renown like you where you're talking about library congress and things uh and I, I I'd also think that sometimes maybe the, um, you know, there, even within a public library system, you're going to have different specialties like children's librarians and uh, librarians uh, who focus on youth services and family services, uh, business librarians and like others that that help in various ways, and uh, and and that might not be you know the work you would do at a at like the Library of Congress would probably be very, very different and and might not make that person happy <laughs> if you're like a, a a children's librarian and like that kind of work. If nothing else, that'd be a hell of a boost to your ego though to get, get a <laughs> email from the library of Congress. And from that. Yeah, it would. <laughs> you can imagine. Maybe if you that happened, maybe it was like a get a more pay for your current job, right? Hey, yeah. they, they want to take me. What are you gonna yeah. do about it? <laughs> yeah. So from your point of view, how is the library like kept up with tech, right? I mean, going from the Dewey Decimal System, everything in person, like, you know, all the tech we have now, how has libraries in general done a good job of that, bad job, or just, you know, what's your think, think, feelings on that? Yeah, I think this is something where, like, we're kind of always, we're always trying to catch up <laughs> in, this res in this respect. Uh, and just when you think you're caught up, you know, something else happens. <laughs> and, then, and then you're, uh, uh, like, having to, like, embrace that next next step of of technology um you know for for my work with uh with supporting businesses it's a good example um where uh libraries have been supporting you know, or i should say seattle public library has been supporting people starting and growing small businesses in seattle for a very long time since like the library's inception in the 1800s so so we have this long tradition of uh of 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 the uh, people who are uh, getting support through through the library system, um, and that the technology needed to support that looked very different. Where it was print technology uh, in in the earlier days, than you know now you know where like we're we're going we're running to databases and things that uh, of that nature that that help uh, people, whereas we're able to do it with more directories and and print kinds of things back in the day. Um, so. You know, we we not only needed to uh, in in the you know around 2000, uh, we not only needed to upgrade our tool set, we also needed to upgrade how we did uh, the work that we do supporting entrepreneurs. Uh, and one of those things that we did uh, actually came from some of the some funding we we're talking about through the uh, Seattle Public Library Foundation, gave the library some funding to explore uh, services for for entrepreneurs and nonprofits and to talk about uh, or to figure out like how can we better uh, meet this need that we're are, we know we're hearing from our community so myself and a group of other librarians uh embarked on a little bit of a research project but also uh investigation and a, a you know 
of, of like, here's what we do now for this group. And here's what we, we think we'd like to do. And so as a result of that, we launched this library to business program um, that, uh, that, that, that helps people. And there's a lot of technology uh, that goes into that and a lot of, a lot of uh, differences that uh, in, in how we, uh, how we've done our work um, in, in, in all of that too. And I'm sure this isn't a challenge, but I'm sure I've done this before. Like, but how do you handle like, you know, customer one comes up and this feels like very tech sad, right? You know, cloud-based, everything's, you know, real tech advanced, like, you know, off to the next level. Next person comes and they're like, you know, paint the same like 1950s, right? <laughs> Everything black or white. What does it do? Decimal system at? Like, how do you take care of these customers like on both extremes? Yeah, yeah. So we, I think, you know, I think that's something we're really good at. Uh, where uh, when when that when we have that person in front of us, it's uh, uh, that that's either like one extreme, like super tech savvy, and they're building something that's uh, tech based, and maybe we don't understand it, and we're trying to figure it out as we go. Um, or that person who really is, you know, starting something in their, uh, they don't have all of those tech skills, really like trying to help meet them where they are, you know, and being that, like we mentioned earlier, that concierge, um, I think that's something that, uh, we can do really well, uh, be because it, with that perspective, we're sort of, we're, we're, it's not a, no one size fits all. We're, we're able to, you know, really kind of think about and, you know, at the end of the day, what what are those like those needs that are going to be be helped? And the answer, you know, might be very different for 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 one person. Even if they're both like starting a restaurant, uh, it, the answer might be very very different. And the resources we run to and and we help with will be different. And I'm guessing that's for the skill of asking the question to get the question that actually comes through, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So uh, so when you hire like a new librarian, right? I'm presuming you know they have a degree, so you can presume they know the like the basic library stuff. But what do y'all do to make sure they are actually like good at customer service skills? Because I mean, you have to are you a customer service based organization, right? So you have to take care of customers. How do you make sure they're like actually doing that correctly, or at least to your standards at the Seattle Public Library? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we do a lot of uh, mentorship and um, and uh, shadowing and on the job training. And uh, I think you know another big thing that we that we do really well is working. Um, alongside each other, you know, in, in, in that. So we'll have somebody who we were talking about, like, you know, th those, those uh, librarians that are, that are in a branch, you know, a neighborhood branch, um, they, they go, uh, th they have ex certain expertise and they work alongside us at the central library and we work together to learn from each other. Uh, and, and so, so we're, we're able to, uh, support each other in the work you know so it's it's less about like how you know you, you know it's it, it's more it's more about like helping somebody build build their skill sets uh and uh, in the in the work and in the moment um so providing that support system that allows me you know when when a colleague gets a, a really tough question having a system in place where they can connect with me and other colleagues to uh really get some some help and and uh and we all learn from that in the process so research has the basic aspect of research changed any or like if someone was a, a if someone was a great researcher in 1975 they could be a great researcher now or is like tech change how people research i think i think somebody that that uh that knew how to research in 1975 would have a as long as they embraced the technology, they'd have a pretty easy job of applying some of the similar skill sets to the work. But 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 the how is super different. <laughs> uh, and and I say this because I had the experience of coming to the library in about 2009, um, and I got to work alongside business librarians who had been doing that for the 30 years before that. You know, like they had been literally helping small businesses start and grow uh, through that period. They, uh, they the the tools they used were very different, but some of those strategies and skill sets um, that I learned from them, I apply in my work today. Uh, uh, where uh, things like uh, understanding uh, NAICS codes, you know, so like what is the industry code for the for for the industry? If I can understand that, then I I can do a better job of finding more information about this. 
uh, what's going on in the industry. Uh, so so they, they taught me some of those kinds of things. Another thing that like uh, another example that I, I hear in my head over and over again is uh, when I find a, a really hard question, try to understand what's the trade association for the industry um, or, or, or multiple trade associations for the industry, because they might be out there doing um, uh, the original research and producing some of the data that goes into some of these expensive reports that uh, that the library might not have or something. So that I hear, I hear that over and over in my head, and I learned that from a librarian who who had been doing uh, research for for a, a long, long time. <laughs> so Jay, I know like you help a lot of people with business market research. Can mm -hmm. you explain how you help them that, and how you help them? What ex exactly is business market research? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so. Uh, when I try to, I, I try to break down market research into three categories, three questions that people ask. Um, and uh, and those, those three questions help me when I'm stuck. And they also help, you know, that entrepreneur when they maybe don't know quite how to approach market research. We often find someone who, uh, who will come to us doing market research, but they are kind of like, I don't know where to start. <laughs> like, and so those three questions are, who is my competition? Um, that's the least important of them, <laughs> usually. Uh, who is my customer? That's the most important of them, <laughs> usually. And uh, what are the trends happening in my market? Is this market growing? Is it shrinking? Uh, is it uh, like, you know, how much do um, other companies in this industry spend on advertising as a percentage of sales? Like all those kind of like those kind of statistical types of data. So we need to do having someone out how you handle this? Like some, like obviously they're not going to do the work for them. You point them the right tools. Well, if someone's like, goes back, no, I want you to do this for me. I need help, more help. How you like, you know, it's like no customer, like I turn you the tools, you know, this is all I can do for you. Like without being you know, a jerk, or whatever, you know? Yeah. 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 So we, we, we try to help people as much as we can. We think about those technology barriers if, if there are some of those too. So if, if somebody is having, you know, a, a tough time, um, you know, getting into a database and doing the search, we will help them with that and and help deliver that report. Um, it is up to them to go through that and pull out the things that are important. Um, and and you know, if somebody pushes back on that, like you know, I I try to you know you know kindly point out that like you know they don't probably it's not my perspective you know and and I don't know I don't know all of the stuff that about what they're trying to do. So it will it it's going to help them to go through that process themselves. Um, and, you know, a similar kind of scenario is, you know, sometimes I hear people who are really going to go out and hire this, hire somebody to do the, the market research or, or to, to, to write the report, you know, for them, you know, might write their, uh, not report, but uh, their business plan. And, you know, there's so much that gets missed if you, in the process, because building a business plan is planning and if you're not doing the planning and you're having somebody else do it, how do you know that you're having it done right? And to, you know, it, it's your, it's your business. And, you know, if you're not doing the planning, then they might get it wrong. <laughs> so there's no one way to do it. It really is a, a process, not a, uh, a, just a, a tick in the box, you know, and I think that's something that we try to help people understand and then usually when they understand that of like, oh, wait, this is going to affect how my business runs in the future, um, then the perspective changes. And, and, and sometimes I share examples and stories of other people who have had epiphanies doing the market research. And, uh, and, and that uh, sometimes can help them understand like, oh, wait, I'm going to miss out if I don't do this myself, because there might be something that pops up that... Um, that I know I want to do, but, uh, but Jay doesn't know anything about that. Cause yeah. You know, yeah. So Jay, what other ways do y'all support entrepreneurs at the public library? Yeah. Um, workshops are another way or events and things where, uh, we try to help people, um, build up their business skill sets. Um, sometimes those are more kind of connection kind of events where they're connecting with, um, others in the community that help um, them start and grow businesses. Um, other times it's more kind of a one-to-many kind of uh, learning event where you're, uh, you know, 
a workshop or, of some sort where the, we're learning about how to build a business website or we're learning uh, how to uh, market the business or, or those kinds of things. Uh, and so those, those are some kind of workshop type things. We also have, uh, uh, so right when, uh, right after uh, the COVID closures, we started to hear a lot of legal questions, questions that people had that were legal in nature, and uh, in, in we didn't have a, a resource to be able to um, to help them with that. So we worked with the uh, University of Washington uh, Law School, um, which uh, the, the School of Law, um, and uh, developed a, uh, a set of legal consultation and legal consults. Um, where people can meet with an attorney for 30 minutes and uh, get questions answered uh, uh, from that attorney. They don't form an attorney-client relationship, uh, so they can't. The attorney is not going to do work for them, but they can um, sit down with this expert in intellectual property law or ex expert in corporate law and ask those questions that they that they have about how that um, kind of law works. Um, super powerful, and so we started doing it. Um, as part of uh, you know what we were doing during COVID and helping support people, and uh, and we never looked back. We 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 continue to do them. There's some this afternoon. <laughs> and do you have like a partnership with like the University of Washington Libraries or any local college libraries? Yeah, that that is done in partnership with uh, not the University of Washington Library, but the, the School of Law, um, but the uh, and also with the Seattle Office of Economic Development is a, a partner on that that part project as well so for yourself what's your own personal career goals like you want to become like the like the the head librarian library of congress like you talked before or like what's your like career goal for yourself I, i'm pretty happy where i'm at like right now, at right now? Okay. yeah yeah i i uh i i like the uh i like the work uh i like the uh the the what i'm doing i like the how uh so so i'm, I'm pretty happy in the the specific uh uh role that i'm in right right i have now. to imagine you meet some very interesting people too oh absolutely absolutely that's another part of my work that i love is i that can't imagine any like no not one day is the same is it i mean never <laughs> always different <laughs> yes so um the library is it's a public institution right if you can come in whenever you want to like can you like pose you know someone's been like for like eight hours you you come to say hey you've been here too long or it's like as long as like like stay quiet they can stay as long as they want to you know how's that work yeah, they can stay as long as they want. We are we are free and open to all. Um, and so, uh, if somebody wants to stay there, walk in when we open and uh, leave when we close. That's, that that is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, no library is supposed to be quiet. But is there like a minimal noise level you allow? Like, you no, know, if people have a quiet conversation, you know, as long as they're not yelling, you know, how does that work? Is that was that each individual librarian's decision to decide what's too loud? Yeah, it depends on the space, you know, and the and what's going on in the space, you know, like there we 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 like at the central library, uh, we have a lot of spaces where um totally appropriate to engage in conversation and to talk. And you know, we have uh you know things happening uh, around. And then we have a space up in the uh, our reading room up on the top floor where uh, the expectation is that people are there engaged in you know quiet study. So we we want the noise level to be. Um, not distracting up in that area, um, where it would be very different um, downstairs. Um, and and I will acknowledge that sometimes, you know, um, you know, in in the course of of my work, I might be the loudest person in the room. Because <laughs> let's face it, like you know, we're we're, we're talking, we're verbalizing, you know, but we, to to do the work we need to do, um, we we need to sometimes, you know, uh, make some noise, and uh, and that's okay. And and so uh, sometimes. Uh, I remind people that, like, you know, I'm sometimes the loudest guy in the room. <laughs> so you might not know this, but there's something shown like on like the average number of customers y'all get per day. Uh, I don't know per day right off hand. Um, I know that uh, pre-COVID uh, numbers for the central library, like yearly, um, it was between 1.5 million to 2 million people would walk through the door every year. Okay. So that's the scale. <laughs> and I, I think we're back in a similar kind of numbers, yeah. uh, maybe not quite to the level where we were before. Um, but, but I'll tell you, like when I walk in there this afternoon, it's, uh, pretty vibrant, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. A library should be vibrant, you know? It should. Yeah. You know, always get the stereotypes of a library, the ladies, like be quiet. It was like, <laughs> no, you know, leaves, I think it should be vibrant, you know, to an extent, of course. Yeah. Yeah. To an extent. There's, so there's... the library, you know, you also have many different people, right? I know you have like a lot of times you have like, you no know, elementary school kids coming through for like tours and stuff. 
And the library is like what? 11 floors, right? Uh, 10 floors are open to the public. And then we have uh, a, a, uh, two floors. All right, nine, nine floors are open to the public uh, and then two floors that are staff areas. So with all this open space, you know, different floors, different people coming in, you know, kids coming in. How do y'all make sure everyone stays safe? You know, like nothing like bad happens to people in there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we're we are we have our uh, you know one of the things we do is is we uh, we have rules of conduct, but you know that that we expect everyone to um, abide by while we're there, and we and we expect the library to be a safe space. So if somebody is uh, you know feeling harassed or something, we encourage them to come to the librarian and. And, uh, and 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 let us know what's going on, you know, those kinds of things. So we want people to feel welcome and uh, we want people to uh, feel safe at the library. Uh, we also do have a, a children's area that's for, you know, families and children. So in, at the central library, that's, you know, downstairs and off, off on its own area. So that, you know, helps with with uh, so that kids can be louder in that space <laughs> and people aren't uh, aren't. Uh, uh, angry about that, uh, and so they can enjoy their time uh, there too. Uh, but we have these, you know, these rules of conduct are, are kind of touch points of ways that we um, that we share the space is the way that I uh, uh, that I explain that to, uh, is that like these are these are how we how we share uh, this public space. So I'm making this question up, but like obviously anyone can go to the library. Regardless, hey, well, so post some come when it comes in there. Like, okay, you look like you're eight or nine years old. I see no adults around you. What's going on here? You gotta go talk to the kid. Hey, are you here alone, or are you just okay? It's just another another customer for me. And as long as they don't bother anyone, we're, we're good with it. How does that work? If it's like a a, a young person yeah, that's like, on their own, yeah. um, it depends on, on whether or not you know. We don't know if you know mom or dad or an auntie is around the they're on the corner. Um, but uh, but we're uh, we're we're we, we try to be aware of the space and what you know what's going on. And if that if that uh that child comes up to us and is asking us for help or for uh you know indicates that they're, they're lost or something then then we'll, we'll we'll try to help but uh uh but but we don't we don't know if that you know yeah. that that young person but we do we do try to be aware of, of the space and uh and and we engage people in conversation around like how are you doing today so that if, if someone is shy or lost or something like that that might might um uh, be a way that we can kindly kind of start to learn that. And then the other extreme, I suppose someone comes in that are kind of elderly, they look like 89 years old. And of course, they're not bothering anyone, but you see they come in every day. They're, they're there for like eight hours a day, right? You like kind of like go to them and say, hey, you know, you need help with anything? I see you're here all the time. Anything you're looking for? Or you like pretty much like leave them alone. Uh, we'll, we'll probably, if there's somebody who's coming into the space all the time, one of our roles is to welcome them. So, uh, to, so we're going to like, you know, come up and, you know, have a smile, um, ask them if there's anything that they're uh, looking for or need help with today. And, uh, and, and, you know, if they, if they indicate they want to be left alone, that's, that's fine. Like, we're, you know, that we'll, we'll back off and, and, and not help, but that's our customer service, right? Like, so we, we, we want to make sure people feel welcome um, and get the help that they're needing, whether they're shy about that, or sometimes people don't know what kinds of things we have too. So that conversation can help with that. As well. Would anything trigger y'all to like actually call like the not the police like the, like, a, like a mental health people or some some other safe organization like you no know, child protective services would a case be or elder protective services like would anything trigger that? Uh, if if there's someone that you know obviously is in crisis, you know that will will uh, will you know and, and there's something going on, um, uh, we 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 will uh, uh, we 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 at the central library and at some from our branches. Uh, we might be the first person to to respond to that, you know, and uh, and if we find that happen, you know, that find that somebody who's in in some sort of crisis, uh, we do have um, staff members who focus on social services, for, you know, for 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 people. We have social workers that um, are on staff and are help help directly, and then help other staff understand how to help as well. Um, and uh, and so we'll try to help that person find whatever help. That they that they are looking for that 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 they need, um, and uh, and that could look you know very different. Maybe it's a health crisis that they're in. You know, I've uh, you know if if somebody uh, one of the, one of those uh, rules of conduct is some if somebody's sleeping in the library, uh, and one of the reasons we have that um, that in there is that we don't know if somebody is having some sort of you know uh, health crisis. Mm -hmm. And that's why their head's down on the table. Uh, and so uh, we want to be able to respond if that's the case. 
Uh, and uh, then we would, you know, call, you know, to get to get help and, and sometimes a, an immediate, immediate help as needed for that kind of thing. So during pre-talk, we're talking about, you know, what's tough for Seattle to find a public bathroom or a public parking, right? Yeah. <laughs> I still know, you know, obviously the library is a public place, but I know like a, a lot of homes could use it like as a bathroom, you know, they go to shave, you know, and of course, there's no rest for them to do it, right? And I think it's a good thing a lot of them do that, right? But how do you like balance letting them like use the facilities versus them distracting from customer service, distracting from customers? You know, how does that work? Yeah, we want everybody to come in and be able to use the bathroom and use the use our uh, uh, our buildings and 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 everyone to feel safe, you know, regardless of where where or why they're coming to the library. Um, you know, if, in that shared, you know, in that uh, like sharing the space, you know, we do want that use to like kind of you know be. Uh, use of the the facilities to, to be reasonable to so be to reasonable speak. yeah and so we'll help people find uh other kinds of services um where uh, where where they can take a shower or uh those kinds of things and and sometimes people don't know where to where to go to 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 do those kinds of of things and there are you know places where they can go and so we want to help them find find those um those services if if they need it okay good good uh so next we didn't talk about this the pre-talk but I got your website up, so I don't know if you want to go do like a quick demo of your website and just talk about that. Sure, okay. yeah. Just tell me where to go to and point out. I'll go there. Yeah, go to programs and services. And then go to business and nonprofit. So this is the little landing page that um, uh, are the programs that I do that support businesses and nonprofits. Um, so we've got a lot of things going on, but this is kind of your one-stop shopping um, location for that kind of support. Uh, I will, if you scroll down to the very bottom, you'll see a little bit up, um, right where there's tiles a little bit further. Yeah, there, there, where those tiles are. You can see we've got um, upcoming events. Uh, a lot of the events that we have um, on the immediate horizon are those legal consults I was talking about. Um, those are all virtual, um, so. And we and we got them kind of planned out. We are working on other events that'll like show up be, you know, in this calendar beyond that. Um, but uh, but those are some that we have like. And you have to try to event like time. once a day, once a week, or, or just depend, so to speak. It depends. Okay. Um, you know, we do between you know in the course of the year, it uh, we end up running for like kind of work the workshop kinds of things. We end up doing um, between sixty and hundred of those per year. Um, for these consults, I don't count those in that. Um, we'll end up doing, uh, this year we'll probably do 60 or so of those kind of event-based and those will serve uh, around uh, two to 400, actually more more along the, uh, th you know, probably like 300 people will will come to those uh, consults. And do the annexes use the same website or each annex has their own individual website? Oh, you mean like the branch libraries? Yeah. Uh, they all are represented here on the okay. on the library's uh, webpage. Okay. Uh, this is a system wide program, so um, their uh, uh, their event. If we did an event um, like at Beacon Hill or something, it would show up in this um, this set of tiles, yeah, because it's business related. But it would also show up on the Beacon Hill page too. Okay. So we kind of surface uh, events like that in different places. And the library is open seven days a week, or any days all closed. It depends on the location. Um, so if you go up to hours and locations up there, and then go to all locations, I think that's a really a th the blue thing at the top. You can see a little map of all okay. the locations, nice. and then it's uh, and then as you scroll down, uh, then you'll see like the hours and uh, of each branch there too. So it depends on the branch. So you can see some are like open at noon to eight, um, ten to six. Um, uh, but we I'm have, I'm guessing the different hours based on like number of people that certain branch gets in. Yes. And our staffing, you know, we, uh, the, you know, we, we try to be open as, as much as possible. Um, but, uh, we also have to think about, you know, each one of those locations, um, is a, uh, you know, we have to have enough staff to, to, to and stay people open. do new vacations, life comes out, you know, they get sick, you know, no kids get sick, all that stuff happens. Yeah. Yep. So we have to balance all of those kinds of things. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we also have been, uh, working from, uh, working our way back from the closures, you know, so we're, you know, we, we too are impacted in some of the similar ways that, you know, uh, the, 
what was it the like people moving jo- different taking different jobs and kinds of things and so we're 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 kind of constantly kind of working our way back up to those uh those those hours and things we've been throughout 2021 and 2022 like adding adding back hours because we had to like you know from back we there were zero for a while <laughs> we, were, we were we were some of the first uh parts of the city to be open um, we had certain locations that were open for access to bathrooms and things uh and uh and then uh the, but we were also doing kind of uh on the street uh checkouts um outside you know, contact list pick up and things too so we're still working our way back from from some of those uh those times is there anything else on the website you want to highlight or go to yeah go back to the programs and services and then business and nonprofit and then on this page uh another thing I want to I want to highlight uh scroll down just slightly and you see those um business appointments page this one yep so on this page for entrepreneurs and nonprofits, this is a this is our one-to-one services um, booking play, page. Uh, if you click on the business information appointments, this is how you can um, book an appointment with me or my colleagues. Um, and, and, and for this, for fast, yeah, like someone gets on the site today, how like what is appointment like today, two weeks from now, like how backlogged are y'all as far as appointments? It depends. Let's look. Actually, <laughs> it depends on the day. Uh, so like right now, we're looking out. It like looks like we're all booked <laughs> at the moment. Uh, this is a very I'm popular a service. service. Yeah, a lot uh, of people take advantage of it like and they should. Yeah, but when people find this um, this situation we have today, uh, which I'm not surprised we, we we've been uh, you know this is so popular and and has actually increased through the summer, which is which is interesting. Um, uh, I try to uh, make myself available at times that maybe don't work for people in our regular uh, services here, or that, uh, you know, in this situation where they're, they're all booked. So in this situation, we would have people, we, we ask people like write to us. I'll often send people, you know, here's some times that work for me next week or in two weeks. Like you do with this podcast. Yeah, exactly. And then we'll, uh, it, we'll negotiate a time that works for them because we, you know, uh, we know that people um, sometimes that two to three hour works well for us. But not for them. <laughs> I, I'm <working> now. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I, I think about this, uh, you know, patron that I worked with, uh, who was working UPS in 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 the, the the holiday season, and so you know, none of those hours worked except for maybe like seven to eight p.m. So we negotiated a time, and and it worked just fine. So I I created a, an appointment just for him. So, okay. Nice. So we're we're happy to do that, um, and um, we we definitely have some of that, you know, kind of built in. Um, but this is, you know, uh, ideally, like we would have lots of appointments here and people could just book, click on it and and book them there. Go back one page and I'll, um, I want to show you one other thing here too. So if you go down to the legal consults, uh, a little bit further up, right there. Uh, so there, right here. Yep. Uh, so this is our page where people can book uh the uh corporate law or intellectual property law or so these lawyers law. like how do you find these lawyers like they volunteer the good they're talking about the good will or like there's kind of partnership with them how does that work yeah they're they are uh it's both um they're volunteering their time uh and we have a partnership with them to 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 volunteer their time um something about you know l- the law profession is that they um you know they do pro bono work you know that's part of the built into the the to the professional uh ethos you know, ethos yes exactly of the of the profession and so um these are attorneys who work for you know large local corporations or lo- law firms that um are uh helping them offer their time pro bono to to do this work um yeah. scroll down just a little bit and i'll show you some of the examples there so today you can see we have um these corporate law ones all those, even though they've got the little blue thing, like that, that is a wait list um, for the, <laughs> uh, but, and and it's not a bad strategy to get on a wait list because um, people do drop out. And even in the moment, like my colleague and I will, you know, call people who are on the wait list and say, hey, could you come now? <laughs> uh, but if you scroll forward at the very bottom, uh, just right there, just a little bit higher, um, you'll see the little 
of air, two little blue arrows right there. Yeah. Scroll forward and you'll get to the next date. So you can see there on September 6th, we have uh, corporate law consultations and people can register uh, right there for those. Another popular service you'll provide. Yeah. Very popular. Uh, and but you can also see September 7th, we got availability, quite a bit of availability for those intellectual property law ones. And those are uh, questions about patent, copyright, uh, or uh, trademark, trade name, those kind of things. Every now and again, um, about uh, trade secret, you know, secret sauce. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to go to one part here. Uh -huh. uh, online resources. Let me actually go back. Yeah. Can you talk about data access reference solutions? Yes, absolutely. I'm glad you're bringing me over to this this page because this so, is another thing. So first one, where does this information come from? I'm assuming it comes from the Department of Labor, some kind of work, a small business administration or something like that. Yeah, um, this particular one, Data Axle, uh, is a directory of companies. So in this case, we have right now at the moment, we have 83 million businesses that are represented in uh, this uh, data Axle database. And this is a database that just like the books on the shelf, the library buys and makes available for people to use. Um, so we were talking about like the history and like how I learned to do um, uh, research, you know, and translated my, those skills into uh, doing it with databases. This is a really good example of a I know the library card, it, all the stuff is free, but it's actually very expensive. You bought it by yourself. I mean, exactly. You know, like, like very, very expensive. Yes. And it's free for, for the library card. That's right. Yep. So uh, you can do what you just did and log in here with the library card and you have full access to this um, to this database. So you can walk this through this through with us that like, shows how to actually use it the best way. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And let me back up and ask and answer your question too of where this comes from. Uh, and the answer is uh, a little bit uh, like, I'm not sure all of it, be, not because um, I haven't asked, but because that's their secret sauce yeah. of uh, I mean, it is a lot of information and too. and so they're pulling from lots of different databases probably scraping from data databases and stuff like that yeah hundreds and and they also are reaching out directly to businesses to verify information as well um so for those 83 million businesses that are in here um those are think about it as 83 million moving targets each of those companies might well not each of them but like many of those companies are changing locations yeah being sold hiring, hiring, hiring people uh, revenue, yeah revenue changes there's all kinds of changes that are happening so uh and and a lot of that information that's kind of th that we would like to know about all those changes is proprietary so um so so data axle is a database that uh pulls a lot of that data together scrubs the data themselves and um produces what what they think the universe looks like in terms of u.s businesses um uh, what what happens is <laughs> sometimes you know they you know that is a moving target and so we find that like the, this oh we know this company um moved already from this location to this location and six months later it might be then re represented in the database so uh we have to you know take everything we learn from this with a little bit of a grain of salt um, but it can be a very powerful database and for smaller local companies it's one of the best we can go to. So what's the use case you've seen people use this for? Yeah, so um, go ahead and click the little uh, X of the you're in the right place there. Often what I, and then the US business search up in the upper. Just right here. Uh, not that one, but the one over, yes, that one right there. If we click on search there, uh, often people like get to this point and they're like, wow, this is the this is the thing. I jump straight past this to the advanced search tab right up there at the very top because I know there's a whole bunch of other filters that we can apply with the advanced search. Um, so uh, one thing I'll point out right here is see the little green V verified or right in the center? Um, that is that they have quality checked um, the results um, if I select that box. If I want to relax my search a little bit, um, I can select that unverified business um, piece and I'll get more um, businesses. And everything that's happening over here in the corner is kind of the results of my search in the center. Um, 
So one of the way one of the ways that people use this is to um, identify back come back to those three questions: who's my competition or who's my customer? In some cases, um, so if you go to uh, keyword SIC NAICS business type right there, uh, let's do um, let's let's go ahead and do like pet pet store or pet. Um, see what comes up there. And then click the little search. It's, it looks like it's going there. It's taking a moment more than it normally does. So there we go. So if you click on pet shops up there, it drops into that box down below. Uh, click update count. And let's see what, what did that do? Okay, so now we have 48,000 businesses that identify as pet shops. It's one of those NAICS codes. Um, and then if you click on, uh, let's, let's add a geography. Let's add uh, Seattle. So city, uh, city, state, maybe. And then it pops down below. So you could just type in Seattle there. It's hard to see sometimes. And then that, that's good, probably. I might not like the wad in this case. I don't know. I think you did. Maybe it doesn't like the space after it. There we go. Uh, so click on Seattle. You can do both if you want to or not. not. And then click update count. Let's see what we get. Hmm, let's see. Scroll down to the bottom and see if it's... Oh, somehow it's not selected anymore for some reason. Oh, it, no, I just that didn't read yeah. That's all, yeah. That's all you need to do. There we go. 157 pet stores in the city limits of Seattle, both verified and unverified. Uh, and if I clicked on view results... Gives me a nice list of all the pet stores, um, that executive name, address, all that. So we can really start to understand maybe we're selling a product and we want to be able to sell that to um, uh, th these pet stores. Maybe um, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to like compete with them or whatever it might be. One cool feature here, if you click on heat map up at the top. It takes all that data and it puts it on the map. So we had already selected Seattle. So they're all like kind of hovering there, but that could be like, you know, location mm -hmm. kind of thing of like, Ooh, look, <laughs> I'm missing pet stores here. <laughs> it has a sales volume and stuff. That's very good information. I would think. Yes. Now be, be a little bit careful with this particular database and sales volume um, because uh, like, let's take that uh, lucky pet uh, company in on Aurora. Um, they don't have to tell us that number. Yeah. So how did Data Axel <laughs> get uh, get that? They they estimate. Um, so Maybe like use tax returns that are public, something like that. I mean, they wouldn't be able to access the tax returns because that would also get to that proprietary nature of yeah. this okay. private company. So um, they wouldn't be able to get into that, but they would be able to um, look at an algorithm that says, okay, pet stores in Seattle, this area of Seattle with this many employees are making about this much money. That, that So those are the kinds of things that the algorithm looks at to come up with that. And then they apply it to um, to these. I'm going to click on this one right here. Sure. And of course, all this information sure I take with a grain of salt, right? Yes. Okay. Like some more detail than others, you know, like employees, mm -hmm. revenue, so... I'm just like, so this is a good starting point, you know, like how accurate is this? Maybe it's not accurate at all, but at least it's something to go off, right? That's right. Yeah. And then I would take this and, you know, jump out. I wouldn't just sort of leave it there. I would start to do my own investigation mm -hmm. from this point. Now I know this thing exists or existed. <laughs> and uh, uh, and then I could go and, and and this one I say existed because it's, it is one of the ones that's unverified. unverified okay. So I would even take this with even more of a grain of salt than one that had the little green verified. Um, 
but uh, it still could be useful. You know, maybe maybe they moved on Jackson. Maybe there's another uh, another one in there too. We click on one more before we get out of here. Um, yeah, this, this one right here. Yeah. Also unverified, so yeah. we're not sure. Something, but something in here was uh, was uh, updated on this twenty April of twenty twenty two, and they've been around for about two years. Uh, so I would probably go out and I would Google search this to see can I find a website for the company. Um, we could go see was there an article published in a local public local publication like cross reference with different research methods. Yeah, gives me some different give, different jumping off points. To so one thing I noticed like most of these have a phone number, but I didn't notice any emails on here. Yes, our subscription doesn't come with uh, the e the the email addresses. Okay. That's something that they they then sell. Um, so they we buy this from uh, Data Axle or Reference Solutions, and then they uh, they have another product uh, uh, that they use to sell email okay. addresses of things. So with this product, you'd have to get a company either go in the, their place in person or cold call on them or phone. Or uh, if I had the website, often these kinds of companies because it depends on the type of company but often they're trying to put they're trying to promote their thing yeah. so they can make sales so they'll have an email address on their website sometimes and so with a little bit of sleuthing we might be able to turn that around into something that more yeah this is, i use this all the time it's such a valuable tool for people to use right it's like yeah it's like it's a yeah it's golden yeah but we you know we and we chose you know pet stores but we could have chosen roofing companies mm -hmm. Uh, we could have searched it by number of employees, yeah. sales we could volume, it this, all yeah. kinds of ways. Uh, so there's lots of different, um, lots of different ways to to use this and to, uh, you know, to take these results and kind of you know action them. So is there anything else on the website you want to go through? Yeah, go up to uh, go back up to the business finance fundraising tab at the very top. Um, so you could you could X out of this this page. There we go. Um, click on uh, the Demographics Now. This is my favorite database. Um, uh, for, and and I, I say that because it's my favorite, particularly if people are uh, doing uh, business to consumer. So if households are your customer, data, data, uh, Demographics Now is going to be your best friend. <laughs> uh, this one too, you could search locally. So if we, if we change that from entire US up there in the top, to Seattle, just, just click on it and then type in Seattle or uh, or select it out of the geography list. Either one works. There we go. Yeah, it's, uh, there we got our location set. Uh, so now if you go over to demographics over in the middle there, and then right where it says age by sex comparison report, Go ahead and uh, click on that and uh, not that one, but the one next to it. There you go. Click there. And then uh, let's do the uh, complete demographic comparison report and then click run report. So what this one can do is access uh, census data uh, is really at the at the core of what we're looking at right now. Um, but they do also some statistical math to bring it up to 2022 from wherever that starting place was. Census does, you know, American Community Survey, which comes out pretty often, but they also do the decennial census and things. So they're helping us not have to worry about any of that stuff <laughs> when when and uh, bringing it up to current. So you can see City of Seattle has about 750,000 people. Um, and then if you scroll down, you can see by age, you can see income, like all kinds of like demographic characteristics about who lives in Seattle. So as I'm thinking about like starting or growing a business, I could see, you know, like how many consumers might buy my product? How old are they? Um, all that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, go back up to the top and I'll, I'll show you a different report. Uh, click on that complete demographic comparison again, um, right there in the center. You got it. And let's do the uh, let's do the apparel comparison, uh, consumer expenditure. Yeah, that one right there. And then click Run Report. It always takes a minute for it to 
kind yeah. of chug away there. And <laughs> so now we've changed. We, we, we still are talking about Seattle, uh, but now we're looking at how much money do people who live in Seattle, households in Seattle, spend on uh, footwear or women's dresses or uh, sportswear, all these kind of categories. Um, some of these categories, some of these numbers can look kind of small because they're like, wow, really? Like you, you can't even buy a, a woman's sport coat for $2. Um, so you have to think about like, how often do households buy that, that particular type of thing? And sometimes that can, um, uh, can, can uh, explain uh, why that number is so small. Another thing that I often uh, point out is if you multiply $2 times 355,000, now we have a big number. <laughs> so uh, so if you if you're trying so what basically what we're looking at here is like market sizing. You know, so for for Seattle, if 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 what I was selling was infant apparel, um I would be able to get a local size of the market for my for my product. Okay. This is insane all this information. Yeah, there's a lot here. And there's tons of ways to search this database. I I find you uh, almost need a PhD in the Yale <laughs> database, you need a PhD in the data Excel database. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and I'll, honestly, like you know, it's a good reason to book time with us because um, we've done this over and over again. Like I said earlier, we share with each other, you know, and we work we work closely together to make sure. Um, you know, all of our um, business librarians uh, on the team are all like familiar with these resources and uh, able to help help you in a custom customized way. I can just see where customers get information overload using all this stuff. Yeah, and and we pay attention to that too in that conversation. Like, if what we just did feels like too much for someone, well, maybe you know, in that in that reference interview when we're talking to them. Maybe we don't go through all of that quite yet. Maybe we like sort of plant the seed of like, hey, we do have this kind of information that you might need at some point, but maybe really what they need at that point is really um, more of a referral to an organization that helps like SCORE or uh, Business Impact Northwest or Ventures or Small Business Development Centers who can help them in so many other ways. Um, I've, I, I've said um, often that like, I couldn't do the work that I do at the library without partnerships with other kinds of business development organizations, uh, because it would be kind of in, you know, it would be lacking. <laughs> so that other referral out to uh, those organizations might be what they need in that moment. Maybe, uh, maybe we want to, um, instead of going into the details that they're going to need in the business plan, maybe we share an example of a business plan that they can then take with them and read maybe we'll print that out for them and uh and and so they can go on their way uh uh with with uh with an example for their industry uh and and so we work with them to try to understand what those needs are and try not to overwhelm them too yeah i remember i found out about you a few years ago when i was doing some work with the business impact on the west yeah that's a good partnership you have with them um they're great <laughs> they are they are um so next question like there's a lot of in Seattle, a lot of entrepreneurs, startups, small business going on, starting every day. How do they find out the information, right? You know, most, you know, of course, like people don't, we don't go to the library for like this kind of stuff, right? So, how do you get the word out about this, right? This word of mouth networking. I'm, I'm guessing you don't have like no Google ads or Facebook ads or like, you know, TV commercials, nothing like that, right? So, how do you make sure the most people as possible know about all this stuff and use it? Yeah, we, we use it a lot of different, different ways. Um, and I think people come to us from, in different paths. Uh, so sometimes they come to us like you did through Business Impact Northwest. I'm assuming you might've learned about the library's resources through, through that. Um, so sometimes that partnership kind of works both ways. We'll, we'll share with people that, um, that, that Business Impact Northwest exists. They share that the library exists and, and those kind of things. I um, often will do uh, workshops myself at um, uh, organizations that have uh, an audience that might be interested in the library's resources. Uh, sometimes doing sometimes doing events is a way that people can learn about that too. Like they'll maybe learn about the event through um, it, it, its uh, kind of promotion and 
then discover, oh, wait, the library also does these, these services that I can meet with a librarian for an hour <laughs> or the, uh, meet with an attorney for an hour. So uh, it it really is a variety of things. Um, we do work closely with, we have a marketing, the library has a marketing team and we will do um, things uh, uh, with them. They'll help us kind of uh, put things out on social media and things. Uh, an example was in February, um, we we worked with an organization called Black Owned Business Excellence. Um, and and uh, we've uh, been working with that organization for quite a, you know, quite a few years through COVID um, to um, uh, develop workshops and events and things. And uh, libraries supported that uh, that organization in, in that work. Uh, and uh, so as part of that, we uh, we filmed one of the organizers talking about her work um, at the library and then uh, did some of that on Instagram and I got quite a bit of uh, of, of uh, people following it and people watching it um, that learned about uh, the uh, Black Owned Business Excellence event, which was amazing. <laughs> uh, and then we were also there to, to help share, hand out business cards so people can learn about these kinds of things that we do. All, and, and something I should have said at the beginning, free <laughs> so all all of this that you see here everything's is, free is library. free There's yeah no yeah. charge no like upcharge or you know like everything is free that it's all free yeah if you're uh so uh so so the uh so use it <laughs> so um is there any service the library does not provide now that you wish they would provide in the future yeah we're always thinking about that uh because you know things, things are constantly changing, you know, the needs constantly change. And so if I were like, the worst thing that I could do were, would be to like develop one service or one program and do it over and over again until people got tired of it. And then it's gone. <laughs> so if, if we don't like rethink and reimagine and re kind of reassess uh, where, you know, things, then we're not growing, you know, and we're not responding to the needs that we hear. Uh, and libraries work when they respond well and when they um, when they're meeting the needs of their communities. So we're always thinking about that in the in the core. Just like an entrepreneur is thinking about their customer, we too are thinking about like, you know, what does she need? What is what is you know, where does what what are the specifics and how do we reach her and all those kind of things? What uh, do you see the future of libraries being? You know, I think I think libraries have been and and continue to be learning institutions so you know right there what we were doing is learning how to research a market um, we were also getting some access and libraries will continue to be access points as well uh, but at the end of the day you know we do have we meet a similar need to what some of these academic institutions and um, uh, do uh, and for everyone you know and and for free so you know i i i think that you know that part of our mission, you know, is important. And, and knowing that we are there to help people learn whatever that might be, continuing to listen and focus on how those needs change, the what they need to, you know, to learn is changing, and continuing to navigate both the, 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 both the what we offer and how we offer it. I think that's, that's, a, that's an important thing. And I'll share a quick example too. You know, pre before March 2020, we had, or I had never done a business information appointment that wasn't in person. I'd done some on phone, and so it's not quite true, but they were all in person. In March 2020, we needed to very quickly change that uh, because the entrepreneurs we were seeking to help and that needed the help. Uh, indeed, couldn't come into the library, <laughs> and uh, and so we very quickly shifted all of our business information appointments from in person to online. Uh, now we're sh starting to hear that shift back to the like, people asking us for. Did the library again, close but... down like permanently during COVID. We we closed down for a period of time, okay. and then we had certain locations that opened back up okay. um, as uh, access to bathroom facilities. Uh, and 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 then for, for other you know two other uh, collections and things as well, um, but my work with this with uh, this took a different path, and uh, and so I uh, continued to run these programs virtually uh, because we weren't hearing a huge outcry of people wanting for this kind of stuff to like do it in person. 
Now we're starting to hear a few, but we will still continue to do some of it virtually because let's face it, sometimes people don't want to fight traffic to come downtown to, <laughs> to a location, parking, paper parking, parking, all that. Yeah. And that was happening before, you know, and so, um, uh, so, so it's, it's an example of how we had to like quickly react and quickly um, change. And, and I'm pretty proud of the fact that it took me one week uh, before between <laughs> when we when we had our last in person appointment, to when we had our first uh, uh, virtual appointment. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm proud of that fact. <laughs> Oh, people are allowed to go to the library and like do business meetings, either one on one in the library somewhere or over Zoom. Like, is there like a conference room they can like schedule or like a private meeting room they can do? Yeah, we have we have meeting rooms where people um you know meet with other you know people and have conversations about you know a variety of things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it, what, you can book meeting room spaces. Uh, we would ask that those not be uh you know kind of co uh, commercial kinds of things, so you couldn't do like a you know, uh, you couldn't sell things while you were yeah. in those spaces. Um, but, um, but certainly people are having meetings that were related to um, starting and growing businesses constantly and they're making making connections. And we encourage events like that, where that connectivity happens, you know. Um, is there a certain month that like you see like more customers coming in? Or is it like pretty evenly balanced throughout the year? Yeah, we do. <laughs> uh, usually, and I say this usually because last year was was different, and it looks like this year has been is also shaping up to be different. But usually, um, September and January are the two times when we start to see things increase activity around around my topic. December, uh, around, January, December, or no, uh, September, September, and January. Yeah, okay. Um, and I have a theory about this, and I think that uh, you know it, uh, it it relates to well one one thing that you know kind of or two things that play out in those in those two months. One, back to school. So you know, parent has a kid, they go back to school. I can start that small business I've been thinking about. Uh, and then New Year's resolution, I'm going to start that business. <laughs> so I think that does play into it, but I have noticed. Um, other little spikes around time away, like after the Thanksgiving um, holiday, um, other things. So I think that there's also this moment of, um, you know, it's like this human psychology where people are, uh, you know, they 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 have this time off from from their their job, and they're like thinking about this. They're spending some of that time thinking about this idea and this this maybe it's a business idea, and they're gonna like run with it. Then. They go back to work. They're unhappy. <laughs> it's jarring. I just came back from vacation. Oh my! <laughs> uh, and uh, and they're like, "I'm gonna go start that business." <laughs> so I think there's some of that that happens too. But uh, but I the the difference difference uh, that the thing that you know has played out the last two years in the past summertime was kind of you know our numbers went down. Um, and that has not happened this year and didn't happen last year either. So I would think the numbers in summertime will increase because kids are out of school and the parents are taking them to the library. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. And so I I uh and most of my the stuff, the an the analogies that I'm talking about are not analogies, but the specifics I'm talking about are related to the starting and growing a business or not okay. profit. Okay. There's a difference. Um, yeah. I do yeah, in I think numbers around like coming to the library for story times and uh, like other getting books and things those probably do go up in those summer months too do libraries still like charge like library fines when people don't turn books back in time or is that an outdated concept i am happy to report that we don't do that anymore okay. <laughs> uh so uh uh, uh and, and this is seattle public library that doesn't do that anymore so we um uh we realized that that was disproportionately affecting uh people who uh were of lower income um and so those that could have paid could afford to pay a fine paid it off and then like you know away they went and others that couldn't afford it really were being disproportionately impacted and then turned away for you know they eventually like, you, you couldn't check new things out on your card um what uh and we did away with that i think it, I think in 2020, we did away with that. Maybe it was 2019. We'd been working on it before pandemic. But um, but since, 
people are returning books at the same rate. <laughs> so, so, it so difference. It doesn't make any difference. People people still will return the books. Uh, if you lose the book, um, I think you still then would would need to pay for it. But but uh, but that like library fine uh, piece uh, for uh, uh, for like late fees is gone. Let's suppose someone doesn't return a book for whatever reason. Like, do you then like replace that book or that book is just out of the library circulation or? It depends. Uh, if if it's something that uh, that 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 we absolutely need, and like we we look at that um, the number of people we, we we collect statistics on like checkouts for that mint that material. So if the number of um, of things that we you know checkouts and the demand for that is really high, we'll probably go and re reorder it. Um, we, we aren't really looking at it at that one to one yeah. kind of thing of like oh we're now missing this one. More managing it uh, as like like the whole collection. Yeah. So they're looking at like, okay, what are the things that are the highest? Um, Cause you can place things on hold. So we'll look at like the holds to number of copies ratio and be able to say like this thing, you know, people are going to have to wait for quite a while for, to, to have this thing. So we look at that popularity of items, um, but we also would look at the diversity of items in the collection, you know, overall. So different we really, authors, so to speak, yeah. different genres. Yeah, exactly. Genres and and like the authors themselves and like uh, we we want we want the library to be a, a place where people can um, get a difference of opinion, you know, look, look at the differences of opinion for for whatever reasons they have for that. So we really try to have um, we, we have a balanced collection, but also a collection that people do want to to use, because at the end of the day, we are, you know, we we are a city entity, and so taxpayers are paying for these materials. So um, the idea and the it's important for us that people use the materials. So we're not going to buy something that like isn't going to get checked out. <laughs> yeah. So there's no more fines, but is there a limit? Like suppose I go to the library, and I you know I don't return six books, seven books, eight books. It was a time where you come to me, hey Jason, like this is out of hand, right? I'm not paying no fines, <laughs> but man, like next time you can't check out any books. Yeah, I think I think if you uh, uh, I, th I think if you if you never return the item, then you're responsible for that, and there's a a, a dollar figure of that that you would reach that would say like you know you need to return the items or pay for them or something. But uh, but uh, but until you reach that number, like it's all good. <laughs> and you all track stats on like what kind of books are most popular? Like you know, is it like history books? social studies books you know science books you have any stats on that we do yeah yeah uh cookbooks cookbooks cookbook why cook, am i not intensely popular. why i'm not surprised <laughs> yeah in part because they're expensive they're large people want to like kind of uh peruse them but they also uh you know maybe they want to like look at them and then they then they buy them or something like that uh the business books are actually a, a high high checkout um part of the collection as well um, fiction, of course, also, um, but uh, but yeah, we do. We look at you know kind of what's uh, what's checking out. There's a there's a group. I don't I don't do that myself, but there's a a group of librarians that that's what they focus on uh, is all like looking at the collection, looking at what's checking out, and buying new things for the collection. It's quite amazing what they're able to do, and they are a small but mighty group of uh, of librarians that make a lot of these decisions uh, around. Um, purchasing. Uh, but I will say also, there is a place on the library where uh, the library's website. So if you are a, um, a card holder, you can make suggestions into what you think the library should buy for, for the collection. Um, specific um, books of like, hey, I'd like to read this thing that I heard about. Oh, the library doesn't have it. So you can make a purchase suggestion. They, they, uh, they aren't always going to do that. But they look at every single one and look at it very um, carefully, and uh, and often they are able to um, say yes. Then how about other libraries? There's always always all these newspapers, news magazines, you know, New York Times, New York Newsweek magazine, like different ones. Economics. How how do like how does that work? Like, of course, everyone can go in and read them, but how do y'all decide which ones that like have subscriptions to? Yeah, uh, we're also there again. We look at um, kind of use and what people are. But that's harder for magazines. It's harder to gauge use because people look, don't check those out. So how do we know? <laughs> like, you know this one's getting used. 
sometimes like use like the if phrase and like well this one's clearly gotten a lot of like re, you know reading time but but we also are kind of like uh watching you know to um understand what people are asking us about and trying to stay close to uh what's happening in the collections um for magazines um and newspapers uh over the last few years we're seeing fewer and fewer of them published like we're seeing a, you know a lot of them going either all online or, or that kind of thing. And we do subscribe to um, electronic magazines and newspapers that you can get to that way too. What's like the most either like, and of course I'm using the word unique, unique can be like many different things. What's like the most unique book or most unique book collection y'all have? Uh, yeah, mo most unique is our Seattle room. Um, so the Seattle room is uh, a, uh, an, it's a, uh, special collection which means that like though that is being managed differently than the rest of our collections um and it's a special collection that we're looking at uh collecting things related to seattle's history um and also things that are rare and uh, unique um and some of those are donations of things that are coming from from people in Seattle and other times there are things that we've had in our collections, but then realized we needed to um, move it to the Seattle room so that um, it can be there 100 years from now, 150 years from now, uh, for people to research our local history in Seattle. And what's the oldest book y'all have? Uh, I think we have some things uh, from the, I know we have some, some, some periodicals from the 1700s. And I think there are, is at least at least one or two items from the 1600s. And these <laughs> these items, I'm guessing, you have to like, if I went there, you, I'd have to be escorted. You have to like do the stuff for me. Like I'm, I just can't go in there and check it out, right? Right. A librarian or someone in the library has to like kind of like guide me through and like make sure, you know, nothing happens to it. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Even the the gloves, and, uh, <laughs> like those kind of things. Uh, it depends on the item. Like there's plenty of things in the Seattle room that you can walk in there when it's open. It's not, it has different hours than the central library. So make sure you're, you know, coming when it's open. Uh, but uh, there, there are plenty of things in there that you could just, when it's open, walk in, pull it off the shelf and use, but we would, for the, all that entire collection, you use it there. Um, there's scanners if you needed to scan some pages or something. Um, but then there are, are other, you know, rare and valuable materials that, uh, that that are also part of that collection that aren't out on the on that on the shelf and that um, you would ask and then the librarian would come and, and share like here's how here's this item we want you to use it but um, we also want you to be aware of its uh, fra it's fragile Forever. and do authors ever like get with y'all and say I'm, I'm releasing a new book I want to do a book sign at the library yeah, yeah, we have a, a a team of of librarians that that do author readings and and book signings and things. Uh, that's less often in the business realm, but I do have a colleague, or at least you know, a number of colleagues that that do that kind of of things. Sometimes they're learning about that maybe from the publisher who there's a you know a popular author who's on a tour. Um, other times it's a a local author who uh is uh kind of reaching out to us and and uh saying hey I'm, I'm doing this this thing uh we we aren't always able to um do every one of them we, we get more of see, those pitched sure, to us sure <laughs> yeah uh so uh but 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 we we want people to reach out to us because we we, we if we don't hear it we we uh uh, then, 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 of course, we wouldn't do it. <laughs> so we we do want to hear. We'd rather hear about it um, than uh, than not. So the actual building at Seattle Public Library. What year was that built? You know, uh, the the building for for the Central Library uh, was uh, it it opened in two thousand and four. So pretty um, recent, you know. Pretty recent. Scheme of things. Yep, but it's the third library that's been on that location. What um, third library? <laughs> so it was like was this renovations or like complete rebuilds? Uh, for for the central library, they were complete rebuilds. So oh, tear down the old one, build this one back up. Yep, the first one was in the late 1890s, I believe, um, and uh, maybe it was early 1900. But uh, the second one was 1960, um, uh, right on the same location. So it was tore down the old building and built the new one. The first one was a Carnegie Library, um, so it had a very different look and feel. Uh, the second one uh, was a 
a uh, very modern looking building for its time, like 1960s, mid-century modern kind of looking building. And uh, and then, of course, we have the iconic uh, Central Library, which also is a modern building. Uh, but is there anything you tell us about the design of it or like, you know, like the usability, anything like that? Uh, it, walk through it. It's amazing. Like there are so many different elements and different. I think the, the thing that I hear when I take people through that building uh, is, uh, you know, wow how i didn't understand how big it was from the in you know inside like there's just so much it's, 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 space yeah, it's, it's really so much there and uh and you know i worked in there for uh 10 years and there were places that i discovered <laughs> after being in, after working in the building like whoa i mean staff areas but still yeah. I, was like, I didn't know yeah. this existed like you know just the, like out of the way corridors that uh that go to uh where it was storing some things or whatever it might be but yeah it's really really big is there a place in the library where like there's like there's a rooftop view or people get a really good view of the city or where people get to sit outside uh, there's no place outside. Actually, the um, the the old building, the the the, the last one had a, a patio. Apparently, I don't remember the patio myself. I did go into that building when I was younger, but um, but the current one doesn't have any outdoor seating. Um, but the 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 views are all kind of they're 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 the views of the city itself around it. Like the 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 reading room upstairs on the tenth floor at the central library has. Uh, lots of wonderful views of the other buildings that are in nearby, you know, which are also architecturally interesting. So that's a lovely place to be on a rainy day when the rain is sort of like coming down or in the evening when like the lights are, are, are coming, but there's not like a commanding, like kind of okay. view of the, of the cascades or the Olympics or something like that. Uh, there are also interesting views down inside the building. So like the architect was really interested in, uh spaces that like, like had views of other spaces um so there are lots of interesting kind of places where you can like look through this screen and then you're looking down on this part or you're looking down from level 10 to level three kind of in internally so jay this might be something you can answer but basically you can like how does the library defend the budget of the city right i'm sure the September of the library has to go to the city government and say we want X amount of dollars. How do you like to you know to spend that money y'all want to use from the city government? Yeah, I, mean, I, I the you know the city librarian works with the the, the mayor's office um, on that budget every year, um, and uh, I don't I I'm not privy to all those parts of the conversations that happen between like what that is, um, but uh, but but it's I I know what I know that it happens and we watch for it and we and we pay close attention. Uh, because we also, you know, that does impact our our work, and we, you know, we want to make sure. Uh, so, so when it comes out, all of the staff are very aware of like <laughs> what what that number is and like how it's different from last year, and uh, because it impacts how how we operate, you know, and uh, and 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 things. Um, and we, and because of that, also too, we are very fortunate to have those two uh, fundraising arms of of the library, which raise um, other uh, other funds to um, help us do some of the work. Some of the library to business um, work comes through funds from the uh, Library Foundation. So a big thank you to, to them for, for doing that part of it. Um, I also have to um, you know, mention here, this is a good moment to mention uh, that uh, this, you know, Seattle over the last few um, years has uh, voted for a levy to support libraries. Um, and so, Right now, that is a, a a significant amount of our funding too for for um, our operations and 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 things. And so we 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 also thank the voters for that for that levy because uh, that helps us do the work that is we that do. Is that levy too. every year, every two years, every three years? Uh, it it it's it's not like a, a like an on, ongoing. We're going to do it this many years, but we currently are on one that I think expires. I can't remember the the date it expires, but uh, but it's been every five to seven years is okay. usually how those those play out. So like you know a five year, and then we 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 ask, and you know we we uh, honestly like you know we uh, right now that we're operating under uh, a levy, um, we're we've got got funds from that, um, but next time we go out, you know maybe the citizens don't say yes to that, so we have to be prepared and 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 uh, you know your libraries are flexible. You know, we, we, so we try to prepare, obviously 
if we have more, we can do more. <laughs> uh, but but we want to also be prepared if and when that you know happens that we don't have as much. You know, and how do we how do we prioritize services and programs? You know, and and how do we do that uh, equitably? Is you know the questions that we ask. As far as like getting a job in library, or do you all hire on a pretty regular basis? Is pretty rare. Like turnover is like like high, low. Like, is it is it rare to get an open library job, or just depends on the other factors? It depends on the on the position. Um, I mean, right. Uh, so uh, it depends on the position and depends on other factors. So, so uh, when when a lot of people, uh, you know, we had that whole moment in time over uh, after pandemic or. Uh, 2022, 2021, where a lot of people were like moving around to different positions everywhere. <laughs> and uh, we certainly were impacted by that. And we were like um, working really hard to bring bring in certain, you know, positions into our staff. Um, so uh, so it really depends on the time and and what what's what's going on in the environment and things. And and also like are people leaving, are people going you're retiring and those kinds of things too. And so your career page is like a Seattle Public Library career page. Was that underneath the city government career page? Uh, both. both um, okay. So uh, you can go to uh, using the library, and then there's a library's careers um, thing, and you can find all the postings there. Okay. Or you could go to the city of Seattle's um, page. It actually links out to the to the postings there. Okay. So let's suppose there's someone out there, either you know they've never used a library, which would probably be like amazing, <laughs> or they haven't used a library in like maybe five ten years. What would you say this person could miss them to start using your library, any other library again? I think there's moments in people's lives where they kind of realize the library exists and realize they have a need for that um, that that library. Starting a business, uh, lead for the services that the library offers. Um, starting a business or a nonprofit is one of those moments where people are like, Hmm. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. I forgot. <laughs> I should get a library card because they've got these things. Um, when you have a kid, you know, we were talking about like having, you know, like coming to the library with your, your, your child and check out materials. That's, that's another moment. Uh, careers, uh, needing to look for a job, you know, looking for um, like help on uh, what is not just a job search, but like goes into my resume, resume examples, um, those kinds of things. Um, retirement, genealogy, like there are these moments in, you know, time where people are like, you turn to libraries. Uh, and I think those are, each of those are important. And yeah, you know, that's, that's where, that's where we think about those moments and, and provide resources in, in those ways. So Jay, is there anything I didn't ask you to want to talk about or anything else you want to talk about that we haven't covered? Um, I just uh, let me think about that for a moment. Like, so I think we've talked about the um, a lot of the library to business services and programs, um, the partners that we work with, um, the tools. I think we've covered a lot. <laughs> we've covered it really well. We did. So, Jay, can you give us your social media links or the library's social media so people reach out to you or anyone in the library in general? Yeah. Um, so go to spl.org. And if you just scroll down to the bottom, down the bottom. Yep. You'll see those social media okay. right there. And those are the best ways to uh, connect with us on uh, socials. Um, and then uh, that uh, that for, for business services, that programs and services, and then business and nonprofit. Okay. So Jay, can you give us any advice on anything you want to cover? Advice, wisdom, or anything? Uh, let's see. Advice. Uh, it, we, we get a short time here. Take advantage of it and enjoy yourselves. <laughs> thanks, Jay. Jay, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it too. Thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for, your, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day. <laughs>